So the first part's on the shoulder girdle. And what I'll do is show them interactively on Osirix here. So first, I just wanted to review a normal shoulder anatomy real quickly. Um, and then as we go along, I'll try to ask for some of the audience input. Um, just remember you have the scapula with the glenoid fossa, humeral head, clavicle, acromioclavicular joint, and then the acromion here. And this process that's coming out here is the coracoid. This would be just a straight AP view. And remember on the AP view, you should have overlap between the humeral head and the glenoid if the glenohumeral joint's normally located. This is more of a Grache view where we oblique the patient and shoot down the glenohumeral joint. So you see the cartilage space well on that view. Humeral head's also an external rotation here. So you see the greater tuberosity along here, lesser tuberosity along here. And then in between those two is where the bicipital groove is, where the biceps tendon comes up and inserts on the supraglenoid tubercle. AC joint here, coracoid process coming out and projecting over like so. <clears throat> Axillary view is real important because that helps us tell about alignment. And you can see anteriors here, posteriors here. <clears throat> Here's the glenoid coming out. And it often looks a little bit ovoid because we're not exactly tangential to it. Humeral head should be centered on the glenoid. Here's the coracoid process coming out, projecting anteriorly. And then if you step back for a second, you can see the, the acromion scapular spine here. And then you can see the clavicle coming across here as well. So here's the distal clavicle. And so you can really see the AC joint if you look for it here on, a, on this axillary review. And that, that can help tell if the clavicle is displaced anteriorly or posteriorly. So that's just some real basic uh, normal anatomy. So <clears throat> real quick from the audience, what are we looking at here? Yeah, anterior inferior shoulder dislocation. So this is an AP view, and you can see that the humeral head here is projecting medially to the glenoid and inferiorly. And typically these dislocations are, are antero-inferior. That's the most common type of a dislocation. Um, so if you look at a Y view in that case, scapular spine, coracoid base here, scapular body, the glenoid is right in here. Now the chest is always going to be anterior to the scapula on this view. So you tell this the humeral head is antero inferior displaced relative to the clavicle. This is the Grache view in this case. <clears throat> and you can see there's abnormal overlap between the humeral head here and the glenoid. Okay, pretty straightforward so far. Kind of a similar case here, um, different patient and what are we looking at here? Kind of already gave you the clue. This is another uh, anterior inferior type of a dislocation. It's hard to see the glenoid in this patient. Um, you can see that the humeral head is lower than this part of the glenoid here. And so here's a, here's a Y view. Glenoid's in here, humeral head's inferior. So this patient have a uh, have a CT scan that I wanted to show briefly because a lot of times these complex shoulder injuries uh, end up needing CT to define the bony anatomy and sometimes the orientation of the, the dislocation. So <clears throat> here's axial CT coming from top to bottom, clavicle, acromion, coming down into the glenoid here. And when you get to the glenoid, you should be seeing the humeral head, but it's not there. <clears throat> here's the coracoid process. And as you get inferiorly, the humeral head's still dislocated at the time of the CT, probably because there's a big fracture involving the anterior inferior glenoid, and then there's also fracture involving the humeral head, some impaction here. So that's a, that's a fracture and dislocation there. And what the surgeons want to know is they want to know, is there major fracture of the humeral head? They want to know if there's a bony glenoid fracture, and if there is, is that fracture big enough to put back with screws because they need to try to restore uh, anatomic congruity, the glenoid, to get this shoulder to be stable again. The, uh, <clears throat> the sagittal views are also helpful. And so here's like oblique sagittal. We're just in the plane of the glenoid here. So here's anterior, posterior. Here's the coracoid process and humeral heads dislocated inferiorly. 
okay? Here's a different patient. This one's a little bit hard to um, hard to understand, perhaps, because it's a it's a atypical view, but it's kind of a frontal view of the of the shoulder. So here's glenoid here, and here's humerus here, and the arm is up. So does anybody know what this type of dislocation is called? Just have one other view. It's kind of hard to get good views on patients that are injured like this. <clears throat> So this is uh, actually called what's called luxatio erecta, and it's where the humeral head is dislocated, typically antero inferiorly, but the patient's arm is up because it's locked. So it's called that luxatio erecta or the teacher's pet because they're like raising their hand, like <clears throat> offering to answer difficult questions. So in this case, the patient got a CT scan and uh, in this oblique sagittal plane, you can see so here's anterior, posterior, here's the, here's the glenoid, here's the humerus that's perched on the glenoid and the arm is up in this patient. So a little bit of a, maybe a tricky patient to, to uh, position for CT. So this is a pretty uncommon type of a, uh, type of a dislocation, uh, luxatio erecta. A little bit more of a subtle case here. So what type of a view are we looking at here? AP, Grache, axillary? Right, just kind of an AP view. Humeral head's in internal rotation here. Here's the AC joint. When you see internal rotation, you can see this, this sclerotic line here. That should be the greater tuberosity of the humerus. The lesser tuberosity is in here, and then the bicipital groove is here. And if we look at the other view, so this, what type of view would this be? Grache. Kind of a grache view, right? We see down the joint, it's kind of overlapping with the chest. So really don't see anything major abnormal here. Um, if I zoom in just a little bit, kind of focus your attention on the greater tuberosity here. Um, contours, pretty good. Uh, maybe there's a little bit of a lucency in here but it's really tough to see any definite abnormality. On this axillary view, he's normally located. Here's the glenoid, humeral head, tuberosity here, lesser tuberosity here. Um, I wanted to show this case because uh, I missed it. And um, if I show an MRI that was done a couple days later, here's coronal T1 and fat suppressed uh, proton density images. And so here's humeral head, glenoid, supraspinatus tendon coming out to insert. And what you can see is in the, in the humeral head at the greater tuberosity, there's abnormal low signal on T1 corresponding with bright signal on T2. And here you can see a little bit of a low signal line. So that's a fracture line. So this is a non-displaced uh, lesser tuberosity, sorry, greater tuberosity fracture. And if we go back to the radiographs for a second, um, I think you can see, uh, let's see this one here that in retrospect, you know, there's a little hairline lucency right here that corresponds with that fracture. So they can be pretty subtle. Um, you know, I'd like to think we would have picked this up uh, prospectively, but I guess a general point is that if you have a significant injury or pain that's not well explained by radiographs, that MRI is a good sort of secondary means to evaluate the patient um, if it's indicated to, to work them up further. Next case here, I'll show the frontal view first and <clears throat> try to window this a little bit. Um, what do you think about the alignment of the AC joint in this patient? It's hard to window this one. <clears throat> yeah, it's widened. It's a little bit widened here and it's also malaligned in that, remember the <clears throat> the distal clavicle, the undersurface, should line up with the undersurface of the acromion. So, so this elevation of the clavicle is abnormal. So that's consistent with an AC joint sprain of some probably a mild degree because this distance between the coracoid and the clavicle is still normal. Um, one thing that's tricky on these shoulders is the coracoid itself. And so in this case, I think it's hard to see um, when I show you the oblique view, you'll see what I'm talking about. But um, 
take a look at this oblique here, and does anybody see a fracture? Yeah, good. I mean, so it's fairly obvious in this example, but you just have to be able to kind of unwind the anatomy on these, these different radiographic views. So here's the Y view, scapular spine, coracoid scapular body here. And if you try to follow the coracoid out here, it goes out and then there's this lucency across it. So the coracoid is fractured across the base and it's displaced a little bit. And sometimes these can be uh, non-displaced and very hard to detect and uh, can be a situation where CT may be done and detects it or patient's got a lot of pain that's not explained by the radiographs and the CT is done and shows you know, what may be an unexpected coracoid fracture. <clears throat> So I don't have a lot of examples of that. I showed show this one from uh, the literature where it's an axillary view. And sometimes the axillary view is a good view to pick that up on. So when you go through the axillary, make sure you look at glenohumeral alignment, but then also look carefully across the base of the coracoid to see if you see any kind of a fracture. Okay, moving on ahead here. So let's see, what do you think about this patient's AC joint? It's also dislocated and there's alignment of the, um, of the coracoid. Yeah, so it's it's definitely malaligned and it's um two things at least are wrong. We, we don't see any fracture here, which is obviously something to look at. You can see the end of the clavicle as I window it there. Um, but the clavicle is considerably elevated relative to the acromion. And so normally what you do is you'd have a line across here. The clavicle should line up with that. So this clavicle is elevated up by about two centimeters. And then this distance between the coracoid and the undersurface of the clavicle, that should be like about 12 millimeters normal. So if it's longer than that, then it's abnormal. And so here, if I draw a distance here, it comes out to be about 2.4 centimeters. So this, this observation is important because when you have widening of the coracoclavicular distance, that, that increases the grade of the AC joint sprain. So um, I have a slide on that as well, <clears throat> and there's six different types of AC sprains. Um, I'd say really the top three are the most important ones to know, and the, the number of types are a little bit small here, but you can see in type one, that's where the radiographs actually may be normal. Somebody just got a mild sprain, uh, and but things are still fairly normally aligned, and the coracoclavicular ligaments are still intact here. Type two is a little bit worse where you have some tearing of the ligaments, some malalignment there, but this coracoclavicular distance is still normal. And then type three is where it's a transition between, you know, no tearing of these ligaments and tearing. And that's where you get this widening of the CC distance. So when you see that widening, you can infer that there's tearing of the coracoclavicular ligaments and, and that can become a more chronic, unstable injury uh, that can lead to further problems <clears throat> for the patient, sometimes like chronic instability, and sometimes surgeons will go in and try to try to reconstruct the coracoclavicular ligaments. Um, I won't dwell on the higher grades. Um, this type four is where the, the clavicle is actually more posteriorly displaced relative to the to the uh, acromion, and that can be difficult to detect unless you look carefully at an axillary view where the clavicle is posterior to the acromion. This is like flipped anterior posterior to what we're usually looking at. Um, type five, you can think of it as like a higher grade three, but what happens here is that the clavicle actually pokes through the, uh, like through the trapezius muscle and is just subcutaneous. So that's more of an added muscle injury and then Type six I've never seen is where the clavicle sort of actually somehow figures out how to get underneath the coracoid process. So types of AC joint injuries. <clears throat> All right. Um, <clears throat> this one is an unusual case, a little bit unusual, but I, um, I had it in my collection. And one thing we, we know is that, um, you know, the, the mid and distal clavicle are easy to assess radiographically, but the sternoclavicular joints are very difficult to see 
on plain film. So if there's a suspicion of a sternoclavicular joint injury, CT is a good way to, to go. This was a contrast enhanced CT that came in on a patient from outside who had a suspicion of sternoclavicular joint injury. And the thing about these is that you just have to be very careful as you're going through to look at the alignment. So as we go down here, so here's the manubrium, top of the sternum. Here's the left clavicular head here. And you can see that the alignment there is pretty good, but look then on the right side, the clavicle is displaced posteriorly here. And like I said, it can be subtle, so you have to just be carefully paying attention to that alignment, but you see the anterior piece of the clavicle here compared to the manubrium, it's, it's posteriorly displaced. And see, there's some hematoma in here. Um, you can imagine if, if this gets to be even a higher grade injury or further displacement, you could impinge on local vessels. In this patient, there's a little bit of high density in here, could just be some prominent vessels or could be a little bit of a uh, small like flake fracture off the end of the clavicle. Um, coronals can be helpful, but again, you have to be really careful about paying attention to the alignment. So here's coming through coronally, nice contrast enhanced CT. And we kind of get through the right clavicle before we get to the left clavicle here. So when you look at routine CTs on your CTAs and so on, be sure to kind of glance at this and say, okay, are the, are the sternomanubrial um, joints normally aligned? So on the left, it's normally aligned, but on the right, you have to keep going posteriorly to find that that clavicle. <clears throat> so that's kind of the end of part one with uh, shoulder girdle things. And I could take um, questions if you guys have any, then we'll move on to part two for the uh, elbow, wrist, and hand.